Well, welcome to this, the third and final talk of the Christian Institute's lectures from 2020. This year, we've been privileged for the Reverend Richard Turnbull to be speaking to us on Christian leadership in times of crisis. And our final talk, which R Richard will deliver in a moment, is this, a failure of spiritual leadership the contemporary church response to COVID-19. Richard, we look forward to what you have to say, but first, one of the Institute's new members of staff, Andrew Wood, is going to give a short reading from God's Word, and then he'll pray for Richard. So over to you, Andrew. Our reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 20, and reading from verse 28 to verse 30. Here Paul charges the overseers of the church in Ephesus with the care of God's church. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for guiding Richard in his preparation as he's prayed, as he studied your word, as he sought to understand your will and purpose for your people at this time of crisis. Through this lecture, may we hear something of what your spirit has to say to the churches. Please forgive our failings. Deliver us from our fears and worries. Strengthen our confidence in the truth and in the power of the gospel and fill us with compassion for the lost. We ask these our prayers in the name of him who loved us and who bought us with his own blood, even Jesus Christ our Redeemer, our Master, and our Companion. Amen. 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 Well, John, uh, thank you very much again for the uh, warm uh, introduction. And Andrew, thank you very much for that reading, that very important reading from Acts chapter 20, uh, verses 28 to 30. Uh, that description of the dual oversight uh, that uh, a pastor has, oversight over the self and oversight over uh, the flock. So I hope you've, uh, uh, well I hope you've enjoyed uh, and benefited uh, from uh, these uh, lectures so far and I hope you've kind of seen what we've been doing and where we've been going, trying to start with some sort of scriptural base for what does the scripture? What do the scriptures teach us about spiritual leadership in a time of crisis? And then something about the historical application from the reformers through to the 19th century, and then briefly with Bonhoeffer. And now, uh, in this lecture, we're going to look at the contemporary church response to the pandemic that we now face. And I've entitled this lecture "A Failure of Spiritual Leadership." the contemporary church response 
to COVID-19. That's not because I think every pastor in the land has failed. I don't think that at all. I think we've seen some amazing examples of faithfulness uh, and uh, so on. It's more collective. It feels like we've not been led. It feels like a real opportunities have been missed or overlooked. Uh, there's a picture of a church. This church will be closed until further notice due to the COVID-19 corona outbreak, coronavirus. God help us all. For a moment, just imagine. The date is the 20th of March, 2020. The Prime Minister has just completed his broadcast to the nation, setting out the challenges of COVID-19 and advising that various restrictions will be in place from uh, the next day. Uh, the closures announced included restaurants, pubs and bars, gyms, leisure centres, cinemas, theatres and some others. Immediately after the broadcast, remember I'm asking you to imagine this, immediately after the broadcast, the leaders of the three main Christian groups in Britain made a joint broadcast to the nation. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the Secretary of the Federation of Independent Evangelical Churches, and the, yes, the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Westminster. The three leaders announced that the next day, her Majesty the Queen, the Speaker of the House and the Lord Mayor of London would lead parliamentarians, the Aldermen of the City, to St Paul's Cathedral, where the three leaders would conduct a service of prayer and repentance, calling upon God for his mercy. Now, just in case anybody's really, really getting stressed at this point, we'll just ignore for the moment the question of participation in ecumenical gatherings. Just lay that aside. That's for another occasion. We're just imagining for the moment. On the next day, every cathedral in the land, they announced, would host an identical service in the presence of the Lord Lieutenants, the sheriffs, and open to the general population. On the day after that, uh, identical services would be held in every church and chapel in the country. The leaders of the Institutional churches made clear that their ministers would visit and pray with people as requested and that the public worship of God would continue unabated. The only problem with what I've asked you to imagine is that three days before the Prime Minister's actual announcement, which did not mention churches or worship, the Archbishops of Canterbury and York announced the cessation of public worship, as did, with a slightly bigger protest, the Roman Catholics. And from what I can gather from reading the statement on the FIC, FIEC website, dated the 18th of March, that is before the Prime Minister's announcement, FIEC, although yes, I understand, lacking power of direction, appear to have supported that same stance. I know what I have described is imaginary. However, I do wonder whether we might have had a different sense of the national spiritual mood, a different sense of our dependency upon God, and a significantly greater profile for the spiritual response to the disease if something along those lines had taken place. So let's consider how the nation's churches have responded to the COVID-19 outbreak. Now I realise there is an immediate problem of our use of the word church. And every time anybody says the word church, everybody conjures up something slightly different. When I say conjures up, I'm sorry, I don't mean conjures up. Everybody has something slightly different at the forefront of their mind. Um, so it's worth just spending a moment or two in thinking what we mean by the word church. In the New Testament, uh, the word ecclesia is used in two ways. Uh, first, 
uh, the people of God spiritually. Uh, the invisible church, as it is referred to uh, by Calvin and others. All who are Christians, uh, bound together spiritually, represent the, the true church in uh, that sense. But the second way in which the word ecclesia is used in the New Testament is that of the, the gathered congregation of the Lord's people, sometimes known as the visible church which is a genuine church if the word of God is preached and the sacraments properly administered. And that is a basically reformed description of the church that unites independent churches, uh, is reflected in the 39 articles of the Church of England that only ever refers to the church in those two ways and was reflected in Calvin in his writing in, in, in the uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion. Spiritual church, the visible church, which is genuine if the word is faithfully preached and the sacraments properly uh, administered. Now we know that over 2,000 years all sorts of structural arrangements have come into play for the organisation of churches. And as we've seen in our previous lectures, there are numerous examples of heroes in the leadership of local churches. And I will come back to that in due course. But to begin with, my concern is with the spiritual failure of the church institutionally. Well, let's just set out. Uh, I mean, things have happened so quickly over these last six months or, or, or so. Uh, I mean, rules, regulations, amendments, changes, tiers, all of that sort of stuff. The pace of change has been quite confusing uh, for, for many of us. Let's just go back to the approximate timetable of what happened in March 2020. So that's the other uh, point about the church, the word of God preached and the sufferings properly administered. On the 17th of March, in the light of the advance of coronavirus, and if you remember the advice at that point to socially distance and, uh, and, and so on and so forth, the bishops of the Church of England, seemingly backed by other church leaders, announced the ending of public worship. It's a really, really important point. It's the first item on, on the list of bullet points. No coronavirus health regulations have even been proposed at this point, never mind laid, for, laid before and approved by Parliament. That's what happened next on the 21st of March, the day after Boris Johnson's prime ministerial broadcast to the nation. The first coronavirus health regulation statutory instrument doing exactly what the prime minister had said in his broadcast, closing restaurants, uh, gyms, cinemas, theatres, pubs, leisure centres, but not churches. And if you doubt me, you can go, as I did, just to make sure that I wasn't making a mistake, to the parliamentary website and you can look out the original statutory instrument and go through what it declares. Makes no regulations at all about churches. Next thing, the 24th of March, um, a letter from the archbishops... Um, and I guess, in, in, a, in a sense, I've only checked this in relation to the Anglican uh, setup. I mean, I will pick up FIEC at various points as we go. But as a, a, a letter from the archbishops, closing churches for private prayer, uh, as well as public worship, and threatening Anglican clergy with disciplinary action if they seek to pray in their own church buildings. Remember, at this point, the state hasn't requested a single thing of the church at this point. Two days later, the next statutory instrument. I mean, obviously things were serious and things were moving uh, rapidly. A statutory instrument, this time closing places of worship, but permitting the live streaming of services, sorry, not the live, the, not the live streaming, sorry, permitting live streaming from the inside of the church if the, the minister uh, wished to stream prayer from inside the church. 
27th of March, the Archbishops, uh, a letter from the Archbishops of the Church of England entitled, Stay at Home, Protect the NHS, Save Lives. The Lord preserve us. I see, I don't disagree with any of those things. I agree with all those things. But how can our spiritual leaders of our nation not begin their, their letter, even to their own clergy, with some spiritual injunction, just repeating the state slogan? And it's not because I think that slogan's wrong. It's just kind of priority. A letter entitled, Stay at Home, Protect the NHS, Save Lives, banning Church of England clergy from streaming from their churches. My basic point is it's all the wrong way round. This is not a debate or an argument or a discussion over how to respond to the state making this decision or that decision. These are the leaders of our churches, uh, seemingly, acting in advance of the state to ban things in relation to the public worship of God that the state permitted. It just seems completely the wrong way around. You, you expect, if the Prime Minister had said we're going to have to close churches for public worship, we might have had an argument, but at least you would have then understood the Archbishops and the FIEC and all the rest of it putting their statements out saying we're going to have to stop public worship. Uh, Dr Charlie Bell of Girton College, Cambridge, has recently published an article called Risk and Prophecy. Has the church got its COVID-19 response uh, right? And he points out that in a more recent letter, and, uh, dated the 23rd of September 2020, the archbishops, quote, the archbishop, this is quoting Charlie Bell, the archbishops urged bishops to be more critical in our response to restrictions that are above and beyond government regulations, which, as he says, is plainly absurd when these very above and beyond restrictions were put in place by the archbishops themselves. It is truly absurd that they write uh, to, in this instance, the Anglican clergy saying, do be willing to criticise those restrictions that go beyond the minimum, when that is precisely what they themselves had put in place. The response of the church authorities was essentially managerial. Charlie Bell's article, which I think is available online, is a fascinating reflection of how an obsession with safety has actually led to an increase in fear and concern among congregations. I'll say that again. The obsession with safety has actually increased the level of anxiety, fear and concern among congregations. The argument is that fear of the disease lay behind closure of churches because of a failure of church leadership to understand risk. It is not safe to cross the road. Rather, it is a risk that has to be managed and mitigated. It might be managed and mitigated by walking to a crossing or a pelican crossing, or it might be managed and mitigated by stopping, looking carefully each way before setting out to cross the road. But we still cross the road. But we have to find a way to manage in our lives the risk that that involves. Uh, one letter from two senior clergy in the Church of England, the two senior clergy on the General Synod, stated that every time we step out outside our homes, we endanger lives. Charlie Bell says that statement is manifestly false. Uh, he said, if it said every time we step outside our homes we may endanger lives, that may be true. But if it is true that every time we step outside our homes we endanger lives, then we would never leave our homes. So, the churches, it seems to me, corporately, and I'm talking corporately here, including... Uh, uh, FIEC churches, not just uh, Anglican churches, but I mean corporately rather than individual examples, seems to me fell into the, he into the health and safety pattern of response to the virus. So, you get regulations dealing with 
the means of administering communion. Um, so you get, you know, lengthy discussions over, well, how do you have the supper together on Zoom? Uh, and people may take different views on the matter, I understand that. But I mean, you know, you, you, or in Anglican terms, there was a big argument over whether the, the common cup is a legal requirement as opposed to individual cups. Um, and seven, I think it was seven prominent QCs challenged the Church of England establishment view that uh, it was not legal in the Church of England to use individual cups. Uh, rules and regulations about the cleaning of door handles. Singing. The own church which I attend, which is a little village church, uh, you know, the, the people want to sing. And they said to the rector, well, you know, are we not allowed to sing? And he said, well, you know, kind of hum. <laughs> well, you know, you start humming and you're soon singing, aren't you? Um, rules and regulations about the wearing of masks. And a whole mass of guidance and regulations. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying these things are all wrong. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, what I'm saying is these managerial matters seem to characterise the official response of the institutional church. And if you look at the Church of England website and the FIEC website, you'll see it's li are literally full of managerial and management instructions. This, uh, Charlie Bell argues, has led to a culture of fear within the church in respect of COVID. This is what he says. Interestingly, I, I'm, I don't think the chap who's right, I assume that Charlie Bell from Cambridge, I don't think he's an evangelical, which is just an interesting, he's simply, I think, a, a kind of middle of the road Christian uh, trying, to, trying to use his scientific knowledge to reflect on what's been going on. It's interesting enough. Our focus on safe has led us to a complicity in the wider culture of fear that has pervaded the nation and our churches since the start of the pandemic. So both the nation and the church has been, have been gripped by fear. Well, what lessons might we learn from this crisis? I'm going to look at three. I'll put all three up, then I'll go back and go through them one at a time. Uh, firstly, that religious liberty and national liberty belong together. This will go to the heart. I mean, this may come up again in questions uh, in terms of uh, what's going on in Wales and the response and all of, all of that. But religious liberty and national liberty uh, belong together. Uh, secondly, health and economics belong together. And thirdly, spiritual courage and dependency on God is central to an appropriate response. So then, religious liberty and national liberty belong together. One of the most important lessons to learn from this crisis is the link between the freedom of worship and freedom of the nation. At the, closer, the closure of church buildings for worship and prayer, nationally for the first time since Magna Carta, although it is true that in London some churches did close at various times during the plague, and by diktat, first of the national church leaders and then of the state, prompted enormous angst and concern amongst Christian ministers. Uh, we know that, not least from a letter signed by some 600 uh, ministers, possibly more by now, um, uh, expressing concern at that move. Um, the reason is not because of an obsession with our church buildings, we call our previous discussion over the true nature of the church, but for two other reasons. The damaging impacts of the restrictions and lockdown measures on human flourishing. You see, God is concerned with the whole person. God is concerned with our health 
and well-being. He is concerned with our physical health, our mental health, our spiritual health. He's concerned with our economic health. These aren't things that can be put in separate boxes. And it be assumed that the only objective, the only national objective, is to preserve our physical health. Because if you do that, you distort the relationship between that, important as it is, you, but you distort the relationship between that and all of the other aspects of human flourishing that God is concerned by. And the second key concern of this letter was the link between public worship and liberty. I am deeply concerned by the decision of the Welsh Government to prevent public worship. Let's be blunt about it. If you live in the county of Powys, where they've had about four coronavirus cases in six months, I'm sorry, don't quote me on the numbers, I haven't checked that, where they have a very, very low incidence of coronavirus, why in God's name is any chapel or church or leader, or eldership, or bishop, or superintendent, or Baptist superintendent, or whatever name anyone would care to give, in any way agreeing to restrictions on the freedom to worship. So even if you think this is a very serious matter, and in the light of the need to protect the health of the nation, churches in the middle of Cardiff shouldn't meet, or, you know, uh, or name your whatever city, even Newcastle, or whatever. Even if you do think that, how in the Lord's name can we possibly justify restrictions on public worship on a national basis across all those areas of uh, minimal incidence? That's, of course, Wales at the moment. There isn't the restrictions in, the, in, the, in, in England. Well, uh, we'll see where we go on that in the discussion. But let's look at these two issues in turn. The damaging impacts on human flourishing and the link between uh, public worship and liberty. It seems to me that church leaders, by which I mean the ministers of real, actual churches with congregations, uh, rather than uh, uh, bishops and superintendents, are increasingly concerned about the damaging effects of anti-COVID restrictions on many of the most important aspects of life which are essential for the flourishing of both individuals and nations. Churches and church leaders have spiritual responsibilities that go beyond their particular congregations, ultimately to God. Policies which prioritise bare existence at the expense of those things that give quality, meaning and purpose to life are deeply, deeply troubling. These matters include the freedom to worship, to work, and to maintain family relationships. None of this, think back to Luther and whether a Christian should flee the plague, uh, none of this uh, means we don't care for our neighbour. Many churches have worked tirelessly to help provide help to the most affected. The protection of the weak and vulnerable is a clear Christian responsibility, of congregations, and one could reasonably argue also of government. However, Christian teaching also emphasises that government must enable people to flourish and to defend basic liberties and freedoms. Uh, secondly, the public worship of the church is essential for our nation's well-being. That's what I really wanted to hear our national leaders say. We too are interested in the national well-being of the nation. We too want to protect the vulnerable. We too want to care for the sick. And yes, we do don't want this virus to spread. But government, state, prime ministers, first ministers, second ministers, whatever they're called all around the place. You know, the public worship of the church is essential for the well-being of the nation. It's so sad they felt unable to say that. The freedom to worship God, to hear the scriptures read and proclaimed, to pray 
These are treasured freedoms that in the past people have given their lives for. And we surrender those things at our peril. These freedoms are a window or an icon into the precious freedoms that our nation enjoys. The nation cannot be indefinitely held in fear pending the arrival of the magic solution of a vaccine. See, I hope there's a vaccine too, because I don't want people to suffer and I don't want anyone to die. And uh, in fact, a relative of mine died uh, from uh, COVID in slightly uh, distressing uh, circumstances. And I don't want any of that uh, to happen any more than anybody else does. But you can see how far the nation has moved from God when the answer is, when's the vaccine coming? When's the vaccine coming? Get it out quickly. If it doesn't work, try detergent. Whatever it is, try anything. Get it out there. Uh, you see, an obsession with fear and safety, the only solution is the magic vaccine. Well, I'm not a scientist, uh, and I'm not a, uh, an epidemiologist or any of those things, but I'm pretty sure that even when a vaccine does arrive, it ain't going to be a magic bullet solution. It's going to be part of a long process from which I hope and pray the nation will benefit. Rather, we have to learn to adapt, to manage risk. One might also just say to trust God. And the idea that this virus can be simply eliminated or suppressed indefinitely is uh, risible. Laudable though the aims may be, policies that cause more damage to people, families and society, physically, spiritually and economically, may prove more dangerous than the virus itself. A threat perhaps to our liberties as a nation, also long fought for, and for which many lives were sacrificed. We must not surrender these freedoms lightly. Christian people and their ministers up and down the land will continue to support the vulnerable, the lonely, the anxious. Indeed, proportionate measures to protect the weakest in society are entirely supportable. Interestingly, I'd put the next sentence, I think, in my notes. Uh, before the announcement of the, of the First Minister of Wales, I put in my notes, nevertheless, we must never again in this land be asked to suspend Christian worship. I, I do believe that. I believe it is intolerable that we are asked to suspend public Christian worship. I do understand that poses a difficulty of what you do uh, uh, when that happens. I recognise that. And I'm parking that one just for the moment. But uh, uh, I don't believe we should ever again in this land be asked to suspend public Christian worship. Never again should our institutional church leaders of whatever type or style be complicit in closing the doors of churches to prayer. To do so would cause serious damage to our congregations, our service of the nation, and indeed would be contrary to the basic duties of Christian ministers. In 1958, C.S. Lewis uh, wrote an essay in The Observer, uh, which was subsequently uh, printed in a book called God in the Dark, Essays on Theology and Ethics. And he entitled his essay, Willing Slaves of the Welfare State. But this is what C.S. Lewis uh, said. I believe... A man is happier and happy in a richer way if he has the free-born mind. But I doubt whether he can have this without economic independence, which the new society is abolishing. For economic independence allows an education not controlled by government. And in, li in adult life, it is the man who needs and asks nothing of government who can criticise its acts and snap his fingers at its ideology. C.S. Lewis absolutely understands the principle of liberty and he absolutely understands the importance of that freedom uh, from the state. So the liberties of the church, 
uh, to worship mirror the basic liberties of the nation. To imperil one is to imperil the other. So just to go back to what we were looking at, the lessons from the crisis, religious liberty and national liberty uh, belong together. And then secondly, health and economics belong together in a Christian world view. Now the COVID crisis has reinforced the way in which post-Christian society compartmentalise every aspect of life. If you only have to go back 150 years and uh, uh, our universities in the teaching of the subjects they taught at our universities did so under the assumption of a theologically Christian world view. Uh, so theology became called the queen of the sciences and so on. But the point is, it was a world view. Uh, and what has happened in that 150 years is every single aspect of our lives has been reduced to its own compartment and its own silo without any interaction one with the other. And we'll come on to discuss experts in a minute and we'll come on to discuss scientific experts in a minute. But in essence, the problem has arisen because you compartmentalise everything, you then become utterly dependent upon the experts of that silo because there's no overarching worldview to help you make sense of it. Uh, it is, in a sense, uh, the Kuiperian picture uh, of sphere sovereignty. And because uh, in doing PowerPoint presentations, doing lots of diagrams takes me forever, uh, I've stolen this diagram from a previous talk I've done, so it's not perfect, but it, it goes like this. Uh, that's how you start the different parts of society now, all separated out into their different compartments. The state, the family, the economy, art, science, culture. You can put all sorts of names in those boxes. And you see they're completely on their own, independent from each other. And what Kuiper did was basically remind us that although uh, that, that only works if you've got God over all of those things. I realise that's a little simplistic. I'm merely trying to illustrate this issue of compartmentalisation over and against the importance of the Christian worldview helping us understand. And as I said, the consequence is that each silo produces its experts as there is nothing to enable a proper assessment of the relationship between different parts or aspects of society. And perhaps then the first key point to make is that there are indeed trade-offs. It, it's, it's almost seen as scandalous to talk about trade-offs today. How can you possibly trade off when somebody's life is at stake? And the Christians, we all go, we all go shy and sort of defensive because we don't, oh, we're in favour of preserving life. Oh dear, we mustn't sort of, sort of comment on that. But you see, in a fallen world, there will always be trade-offs because the world in which we live is fallen and is not perfect. There will always be scarce resources, imperfect information because we live in a world that has fallen. So the choices that we face are not between the health of the nation fully restored with no Covid and economic prosperity as quickly as possible even if there are significant deaths. It's a false dichotomy. Because you can't actually achieve those two points. You are all the time having to deal with how do we as Christians living in a fallen world reconcile those different uh, emphases, those different trade-offs? How much weight do you give to one or the other? It is just the reality there is a trade-off. Too much shrill commentary fails to recognise this basic fact. In a world where we need economic prosperity in order to ensure the well-being of all people, we have to find a pathway between the two poles which manage risk, manages risk and ensures maximum return to economic activity within a responsible environment for the management of the pandemic. And I kind of go back to one of my recurring points you know, it's not that I disagree with any one particular restriction. It, it, I recognise the need to do this. It's just this deep-rooted sense 
the government, the nation, the state, Public Health England, all of these people are gripped by fear. They have, they, it's the anxiety and the fear that has gripped them and is shaping the decision making. But we have to find a way that manages the risk and returns us to economic activity as well as managing the pandemic. Well, let me just uh, take you off on a very minor uh, uh, detour at this point into uh, a, a reflection on this man, Joey Bentham, 1748 to 1832. Some of you, uh, maybe probably all of you, will have heard of Jeremy Bentham, generally regarded as the founder of what is usually known as utilitarianism. Now, there's lots of different ways of characterising uh, utilitarianism, but the usual way of doing it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number. So utilitarianism, uh, based around the world, utility equals use. Therefore, everything has to have some use. That's why when Jeremy Bentham died, he left his body to be dissected in public and used for scientific research, because even in death, the body must have some use. So therefore, uh, it must be uh, dissected for uh, scientific uh, research. Now, we know, don't we, that younger people appear less likely to suffer the more serious symptoms of COVID-19 and are, at least compared to, say, residents in care homes, more economically active. Well, you can probably work out where utilitarianism is going to lead you. The younger are economically active, they're less at risk than the old, therefore the economically active young, less at risk are the ones that matter, and this group over here don't matter. Utilitarianism is antithetical to any concept of natural rights, natural law, or creation principles. So I'm going to come back and talk again about trade-offs in a minute, but why don't we as Christians buy that utilitarian approach? Because we believe God has given natural rights to all of his creation. And therefore you can't just say this, is, this person is more important than that person because God has endowed them with natural uh, rights. So for uh, historians such as uh, Gertrude uh, Himmelfarb, utilitarianism doesn't do what it says on the tin. Utilitarianism claims to extend liberty. Himmelfarb says no, 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 no. Utilitarian restricts liberty because it fails to recognise that God has endowed uh, natural rights upon people in the creation and that utilitarianism falls into the trap of saying people are only uh, uh, have liberty, effectively, if they're of any use. And that's true in terms of being valued in the eyes of God with inherent rights, values and purpose, even if in a care home at the end of a person's life. Ah, I hear you say, so that means we should... We, that means we, 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 we should stay in lockdown. That means we should close the entire nation until nobody dies of COVID and not a single person in a care home ever uh, passes into eternity. On the contrary, the same God-given natural rights also convey the rights of property, of liberty, of commerce and of wealth creation. Why? Because they are essential prerequisites for the well-being of all people in this perfect world. You see, what utilitarianism does is go back to this compartmentalisation. The Christian worldview says you put it all together and your Christian worldview reminds you that the health of the individual here in their care home, which is deeply important, is also important as the economic well-being of the people who are economically active. And the two can't just be separated out. These uh, rights of property, liberty, commerce and wealth creation, necessary principles to ensure goods and services, employment. I, 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 I nearly cried when I saw on the television uh, recently these businesses 
uh, in, in the northwest being closed down, literally people's livelihoods being uh, ended. And although I don't support, I mean, I think the man who opened his gym in defiance of the law, he, he shouldn't have done that because I think that was probably unwise in relation to the law at that point. You understood why and you felt sympathy, even if not endorsement, uh, for what uh, he uh, was doing. And these principles should leave us very wary of those who think government interventions to subsidise wage bills are sustainable in anything other than a temporary way. So how might we summarise the issue of trade-offs? Uh, firstly, simply the statement. There are trade-offs between all options in a fallen world with scarce resources. Uh, secondly, the theological idea of natural rights or creation principles inherent to all people made in the image of God is preferable to concepts such as utilitarianism. But thirdly, God has given natural or God-given rights include economic as well. Not instead of, that would be back to utilitarianism, as well as uh, social rights. Uh, and consequently, there is something deeply moral about returning the economy to a functioning market which creates wealth as all people benefit from such moves. And finally, government interventions should only ever be viewed as temporary. Well, we could say a lot more about that, uh, uh, but uh, we need to uh, move on because this leads me on to some reflections on the place of science in assessing that trade-off. Um, I don't know about you, but right back at the beginning of that pandemic, uh, of the pandemic, you know, you'd have um, the chief medical officer, uh, Chris Whitty, Patrick Valance, the uh, government's chief scientific advisor, appearing at the Downing Street press conference, and we'd all sit there and think, oh, it's really important to listen to these experts. They really know what they're doing. Um, C.S. Lewis again, in his essay, in The Observer in 1958, uh, argues that mere longevity is not an ideal to be sought after. Really interesting application of the problem we've been talking about. The longevity of life is not an absolute end in itself. There are trade-offs. Exactly the same as what Abraham Kuyper warned against if one sphere, the state, came to dominate the others. Now, let's look at these two quotes from C.S. Lewis, which are very powerful on the uh, scientific establishment. First one. Extraordinary, this was 1958. Again, the new oligarchy must more and more base its claim to planners on its claim to knowledge. If we are to be mothered, mother must know best. This means they must increasingly rely on the advice of scientists, till in the end the politicians proper become merely the scientists' puppets. I think that's exactly what's happened. Um, techno technocracy is the form to which a planned society must tend. Listen to this. Now I dread specialists in power, because they are specialists speaking outside their special subjects. Let scientists tell us about sciences, but government involves questions about the good for man, and justice, and what things are worth having at what price. And on these, a scientific training give a, gives a man's opinion no added value. Let the doctor tell me I shall die unless I do so and so, but whether life is worth having on those terms is no more a question for him than for any other man. I think it's amazing that he wrote that in uh, 1958. Uh, uh, and again, I'm, I'm not criticising the scientists. Um, you could say a, a lot of things about the scientists, both positive and negative. My comment is what that seems to me is illustrating what's happened to the government. That the government has become... 
um, um, the scientist's puppet. And government is, has failed to recognise its wider responsibilities on objects that go beyond the science. And that's because we're scared of science. Because we've compartmentalised everything, and every compartment and every silo has to produce experts, and I'm not an expert in that silo, therefore um, my opinion doesn't count. It's a powerful corrective about the dangers of one sphere coming to dominate. I mean, let's face it, not a single member of the scientific establishment, not a single member of the bureaucracy of government, not a single government minister, not a single member of Public Health England will lose their jobs and their livelihoods on the basis of a decision to impose severe restrictions on lockdowns. Not a single one of them. That in itself should make us somewhat sceptical. And how is that power reinforced? Uh, C.S. Lewis helps us again. Even more trenchant uh, uh, quote now. On just the same ground, I dread government in the name of science. That is how tyrannies come in. In every age, the men who want us under their thumb, if they have any sense, will put forward the particular pretension which the hopes and fears of that age render most potent. The particular pretension which the hopes and fears of that age render most potent. Fear. Fear of death. Professor Ferguson, 500,000 people will die from COVID, he told Boris Johnson. Is it surprising the Prime Minister panicked? It's not surprising at all, because he thought that's what he was being told would happen, and he didn't wish to preside over it. And who would? Fear. Fear of death. Remember what I said earlier, every day we're told 80 people have died, 90 people have died, uh, 150 people have uh, died after being tested positive for COVID in the last 28 days. They might have been run over by a bus, but nevertheless, they've uh, uh, been tested positive for COVID in, in the last 28 days, completely failing to point out that 1,550 other people have died from heart, from cancer. Oh, and those numbers are climbing. And those numbers are climbing rapidly because, oh, because we've been protecting the NHS from cancer patients. We've been protecting the NHS from heart patients who have been too scared to go to their doctors or too scared to go to the hospital. But every day we get 50 people have died from COVID after a COVID positive test in the last 28 days, etc., etc., etc. But please don't misunderstand me. Um, uh, it's shocking and sad, and this disease is dreadful. Uh, and everything possible in the name of science and everything else must be done in order to help us uh, through this panic. It's about proportion. It's about fear. Actually, it's about the dominance of the scientific narrative without restraint and without the constraint of the Christian world view. None of this has been challenged, so it would seem, nationally by our spiritual leaders. So, I hope I'm stirring up some thoughts and questions for people to ask at the end. Uh, um, if it's not sort of uh, controversial enough, let me know and I'll find some other things to say as well. Uh, so religious liberty and national liberty belonging together, health and economics belonging together, and spiritual courage and dependency on God is central to any response. Surely, on the basis of everything we've looked at so far, uh, the, the, the Nehemiah leading the nation at a time of crisis, uh, the reformers teaching on plague, the 19th century evangelicals and the fast days and the thanksgiving days and so on and so forth. Surely if there's one central message running through all of those things is that spiritual courage and dependency upon God is absolutely central 
to any form of Christian leadership in practice. And in this pandemic, as in pandemics past, we have seen local church leaders expend themselves for their congregations and indeed for their communities. We have seen ministers, now we are back mostly uh, in our churches, delivering multiple services, streaming online, recording sermons and services, delivering Christian care for their congregations and others. We've seen increased uptake of Zoom and Facebook and YouTube services as people seek spiritual solace from the Lord. Praise be to God. Praise be to God for those things. Praise be to God for the possibility of reaching our people and our congregations and others in those ways. All the more disastrous then that national institutional church leadership has so seriously failed to deliver any model of spiritual leadership or dependency upon God. Well, just to draw to a close, let me uh, list some examples of uh, what such spiritual courage might look like. And then we'll draw to a close. Uh, firstly, we do need to see our national spiritual leaders taking a more courageous stance, uh, like Nehemiah, to provide leadership. A stance that helps the nation understand the importance of liberty, of trade-offs, the problems of a flight to safety which cannot be achieved and a collapse in the context of a public theology, by which I mean a biblical Christian worldview, which helps us understand how we can avoid this culture of fear, fear about death and fear about the pandemic. What an opportunity that actually presents. What an opportunity has been missed. And second, public worship. Uh, we need to hear from those entrusted with spiritual leadership on a wider scale than the local church an articulate defence of the essential place of public worship as a fundamental principle of religious liberty and indeed a protection of our national political liberties. Be under no illusion. If the state thinks it can close a church, it will think it can restrict anything else that it cares, that it cares to at any point in the future. We must not agree again, in my view, to restrictions on public worship. Which again, I emphasise, is not the same as saying we should not exercise proper caution and precautions. And I recognise even in saying that, I'm raising a problem that we face immediately in Wales with a government... Um, injunction to close public worship. As the reformers taught in times of crisis, there is a spiritual imperative in coming under the word of God. Third, oh, maybe I'm just a bit old fashioned. Uh, maybe I've read too much about the 19th century. Maybe I read too much of this stuff. Maybe I enjoy it a little bit too much. Uh, but I'm afraid I do think we should institute national days of prayer, fasting and in due course, thanksgiving. These should be part of the public profile of the church and the leadership of the churches nationally, regionally and locally. Uh, these uh, principles can be advocated and supported by all types of churches, whether independent churches, national churches or perhaps those that are a mix of the two, like the uh, Church of England. But spiritual leadership in national days of prayer and thanksgiving in due course. Fourthly, empowering local leaders. Um, I think the, the rector of the church where I attend is quite exhausted. Uh, the reason he's exhausted is he's poured everything into caring for his congregation. Uh, he's poured everything into making sure no one is left bereft of Christian worship. He's now conducting services in the church. I help where I can. Uh, he's now organising the streaming of those services, Zoom services, uh, multiple offerings to try and make sure no one is left bereft of the opportunity to hear the gospel. 
our local leaders need to be empowered to lead spiritual renewal in their localities. If we're an independent church, to work together with our fraternity of ministers that we are likely connected with, to work with our elderships. If we're in other churches, to work with those churches we can more broadly in our community, to lead spiritual renewal in their localities, to prioritise preaching, worship, to sing, to love and to care. Now, um, I, uh, I don't wish this to be misinterpreted. I don't understand the situation uh, well enough from a legal point of view uh, to comment. So I'm not recommending breaches of the law. Um, I, I, that would not be a wise thing to do from a platform. But I'll tell you what kind of niggles at me is, well, maybe the churches in Wales should gather together as far as it is possible to do as often as possible in the open air to preach, to proclaim and to sing. Now, I don't know. Maybe that would take you across a line that we can't go. Uh, maybe Gareth will have a comment on that uh, later uh, in the question time. And I'm trying not to recommend that we break law. I'm trying to deal with the utter importance of the freedom to worship and the complexity that is then presented to us when that is restricted. And what is sad is that those with national responsibilities in the life of the church have failed to speak on behalf in this way. And I think had they done so, had they spoken to government, I believe some arrangements could have been reached. Remember, right back at the beginning, it wasn't the government who was trying to start worship in churches. Um, uh, so some conclusions. I mean, let me be clear, if I haven't been so far. I'm not suggesting this dreadful disease does not exist. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Uh, I'm not suggesting that it's not seriously dangerous, especially to the vulnerable. I'm not suggesting that we should not comply with the reasonable requirements of government in respect of hygiene, social distance, and so on. I absolutely accept it is within the proper powers of government to impose some level of restrictions. And I am not suggesting other than that so many of our local churches, their elders, pastors and leaders, have been anything other than heroic in seeking to teach and proclaim the faith and care for the Lord's people and beyond. My point is that the nation has been gripped by fear because of a lack of a proper articulation of the Christian worldview in the public square and that the institutional leadership of many of our churches has been equally captured by that culture of fear. My point is that Nehemiah, the reformers, the 19th century evangelicals and Bonhoeffer all understood what it meant to be spiritually dependent upon God in a time of crisis, in the face of plague, and indeed in the face of death. Fear of the disease has replaced fear of God. And that cutting edge has not been presented by our national leaders. And that amounts to spiritual failure. And the consequences not only threaten our liberties, but also deprive the nation of essential spiritual leadership and indeed uh, for national leadership to be, to be replaced by essentially technocratic leadership, the science blob. Is COVID a punishment from God? Most of our interlocutors would wish to retain a place for that possibility. So perhaps we might say in general, yes, for the sins of the nation, the departure of the nation spiritually from God, rather than necessarily uh, for a specific sin and a specific reason. Uh, you should read that essay, if you can, written by uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, uh, published in 1958. Let's leave the last word to uh, Lewis. Oops, sorry. 
As a Christian, I take it for granted that human history will someday end. And I am offering omniscience, hey God, no advice as to the best date for that consummation. Everything that we have said, we have to work out how that operates in the world, the fallen world in which we live, until that time that the Almighty decides to bring history to a close, which one day, surely, he will. Thank you. I have a host of questions here. I won't reveal the source, but you have asked continually for some response from Wales. So I think there is a response or question from Wales. It says this, in Wales to date, there have been 1,722 suspected COVID deaths, only 15 in powers. To what extent do you think people are turning to the state and signs for salvation? because the church has failed to preach Christ as the only saviour. Um, I think I kind of agree with every uh, word of that observation. don't quite know what else I can say. I don't, it was uh, uh, Gareth or whoever uh, offered that. I agree with that. It, it, what the observations, and thank you for that information, illustrates all of the issues we've been talking about. It illustrates disproportionate response. It illustrates fear and it illustrates the, fa the spiritual failure. Mm. Right. Some of these questions are rather similar. How can we most effectively address in public the message of a Christian worldview? Yeah. So I think that's a, a really good question because a genuine difficulty, isn't it, that we face as the church in this country uh, is in a period of numerical decline. Uh, that's a reality uh, that we have to face, uh, looked at over a period of uh, decades. And therefore, uh, one consequence of that is a squeezing of the opportunity for comment in the public space. So, here are two or three suggestions. Firstly, it's imperative that Christian leaders equip themselves to be able to articulate the Christian worldview. So, look at your minister's bookshelf. If it's dusty, give your... I, was nearly said, I nearly said give your minister a kick. I don't mean that. I clearly don't mean that. <laughs> if it's dusty, encourage your minister to give more time to reading and to uh, preparation. Uh, uh, we need to have a well-trained and a competently trained uh, ministry and we need to have a well-trained and uh, competently trained laity not too keen on the big distinctions but you know uh, people of God and then we need to encourage our leaders whether they're local national regional whatever type of leader to take every opportunity that is possible for an articulation of that Christian worldview and that can be in word uh, local newspapers uh, uh, tracks around the area uh, every opportunity that uh, uh, is, is, is presented and also in practical ways. So, for example, being visible. So your church perhaps, I mean, I don't know the situation of all your churches, but the church perhaps meeting in the open air on an odd occasion uh, in order to uh, encourage others to uh, come and join, making the best use of times like Christmas and Easter and those opportunities and, and so on. So it's step by step, block by block. But if we don't encourage our own leaders to be well informed, well taught, and to be able to articulate that Christian worldview, then we are likely to flounder. I think being the leader of a local church is a really hard job. I think it's a really difficult job. And I think we need to do everything in our power to love and support those called into uh, that uh, position. Um, I think one of the things that happens to local church leaders is they get overwhelmed. 
um, it might be different things that overwhelm them. And that might depend upon the situation in a particular local church. Some are overwhelmed by pastoral demands that are placed upon them. Some are overwhelmed by the demands of the congregation that are placed on them for, for sort of services or, or preaching or whatever it may be. But uh, I, I definitely have the sense that uh, 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 ministers conducting a difficult job are often overwhelmed. So, I would encourage you to help your minister. Um, uh, sit down with them, uh, the eldership. Uh, try to encourage your minister to be honest. Most, min I'm, uh, most ministers are dishonest about how hard they find it. They don't like to admit how tough it is. They don't like to admit things are difficult. So the responsibility of church members and of church elders and church leadership is to make sure that the minister uh, is supported, uh, the minister uh, is enabled uh, to talk about those things with, uh, with others, uh, and the minister is given the tools to do the job. And that means a continual, continual process of time to read, uh, time to think, uh, time to speak. Not laziness, not, not avoiding people, not hiding at the desk, not that, but proper time to equip themselves to speak. Um, and I think we need a change, really, in the way in which ministry uh, is uh, conducted in, in, in very many ways. And it's going to be different in every situation, but I think we need to go back and ask, what are the basic requirements and expectations that we have of our local senior pastor, uh, our local senior uh, minister? And make sure that they're not drifting off into uh, those other things. Uh, I mean, I've had a minister say to me, uh, you know, um, in fact, it was someone who was not an evangelical, but was sent to me uh, to uh, learn a little bit about preaching. I was happy to help. Uh, and um, he said, but I don't have time uh, to prepare a, uh, you know, 25 minute exposition for a Sunday morning. And my answer is, yes, you do. You do. What you have to do is plan out your time. What you have to do is assess your priorities. And I think what I'm saying to all of you listening, many of, many of, well, all of you will be members of churches, is ministers do sometimes find that difficult and they do sometimes find it all a bit overwhelming. So I encourage you to pray with them, pray for them, get alongside them, help them and encourage them. But make sure that they have as a priority the equipping themselves to speak in the context in which we find ourselves. This question is a, a factual question, a straightforward question, I think. Comes from not a straightforward person, but <laughs> <laughs> it, say, it says this. Thank you so much for in introducing many of us to that essay by C.S. Lewis. Can you buy it? And can you access it online? So I have to be uh, very grateful to John Errington, um, who has pointed out to me uh, that it is not actually in every edition of God in the Dock, um, because apparently there is an abridged version of God in the Dock which doesn't contain it. But I think, I think that the C.S. Lewis essay is available as an online extract, um, and I would certainly recommend people to... Uh, Google it, uh, make sure it's the right one, check that it's the right one, and to uh, read it if they can. If not, God in the dock, but make sure it's the version that includes it and isn't just the abridged version. Thank you. This question is anonymous, which is always... They're all anonymous to me. <laughs> so, anyway, you asked for Acts 20 to be read... It mentions fierce wolves in the church. Yes. Do you mean to imply that national church leaders' response to church closure was driven by deeper motivation? Um, I think that's possibly a bit harsh. Um, if you mean by driven by, de if the uh, question means driven by deeper motivation, meaning that they are the false teachers and the, and the wolves uh, set among us, I think that's possibly a bit ha harsh. I think. Uh, many were driven by, uh, I think it's people 
have lost their spiritual passion. And therefore, that then turns the response into a managerial response. So I'm trying to be generous um, and not just say, oh, all of these mm. national leaders who have sort of, in my view, have failed, you know, that it, it's because they're driven by false teaching. I think that's possibly, you know, slightly on the harsh side, a bit unfair. They're certainly driven by managerialism and maybe managerialism eventually falls into false teaching. I hope that's what was intended uh, yeah. in terms of the question. And Next one, Richard, we cannot expect our so-called leaders to give spiritual help and advice to the nation unless they have been born again. Uh, absolutely. We need a revival. Absolutely. So, um, those of you who have heard me lecture in times past on uh, the revival in this country and uh, more broadly, uh, you know, holding a particular office, being a pastor, being ordained, isn't of itself a guarantee of the spiritual renewal of the heart. The only way in which we ultimately achieve change is to bring about that spiritual renewal of the heart, which is why public worship is so important. Not because everybody attending the church we know to be saved, but because that is where the word of God is proclaimed and the spiritual imperatives are proclaimed. So I agree absolutely. Ultimately, it's the transformed heart that makes the difference. Another question. One argument against speaking out in public is that it's better to work behind the scenes for influence. I wonder what your view is on that and whether there is a danger there of the desire for influence, in fact, just domesticates the voice of the church and actually prevents the public hearing the prophetic voice of the church. Yes. Does, I'm not sorry, 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 sorry. Does the seduction, the seduction of wanting to have a good witness sometimes end up by being just a way of actually wanting all men to think well of us? Uh, yes, so uh, here's a distinction to be drawn. Uh, speaking in public is not the same as shouting in public. Uh, so speaking in public is speaking in an articulate and informed and spiritual way that is heard. It's not just shouting what we think. Similarly, uh, seeking to operate behind the scenes is perfectly reasonable thing to do, but it carries with it the enormous danger of wishing to be a member of the club, of domestication, of the taming of the passion. So if you like, those are the two extremes to be avoided, being tamed or simply shouting in uh, the public square. And so what we need to do, it goes back to what I said uh, about uh, the need to ensure our ministers and our leaders are properly equipped to articulate a world view, a Christian worldview, and then to encourage them to take every opportunity that is presented in order to put that forward. I do, uh, maybe I'm naive, uh, probably, but I do actually believe if some great Christian leader with a degree of influence in the national scene had said even some of the things that we are talking about today, I believe the m spiritual mood of the nation would have shifted. And I don't think we'd have suddenly had a magic cure for coronavirus. And I don't think suddenly everything would have been wonderful. But I think there is a longing for some form of understanding of who we are, where we are, why has all this happened, and how can we uh, better uh, understand it. So speaking into the public square but not shouting, Yes, working behind the scenes, but being very, very wary of the domestication, the taming, the being captured, and, uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. That's a very serious danger. There's an entry in Lord Shaftesbury's diary on some vote in the 1860s where he comes home and he wrote in his diary, what is the point of the bishops in the House of Lords? Most of them don't turn up, and when they do, they vote the wrong way. Some things haven't changed. Given that the Welsh Government has said services can only be held for weddings and funerals during the circuit break, does that mean they've lost any sense that churches are there for public worship of God and not just for weddings and a funeral? I think it probably does mean that. And I think it means that the, 
the government, so the government of Wales um, is, um, it, it seems to me, is, a, is, is even an even more extreme example of national leadership failure uh, in this crisis by being, by failing to acknowledge any of those things that we have been talking about, by failing to acknowledge the place of public worship in the welfare of people's hearts and lives, by failing to understand that it's even an issue. It's very, very difficult for me to advise what people should or shouldn't do. It's almost impossible for me uh, to do that. Um, but uh, I am deeply, deeply disappointed by that decision of the uh, government of Wales. I think it's appalling. Maybe what we could do, what about if the spiritual leadership of Wales, such that is, is I don't know exactly who the right people would be, called them out, called that government out, publicly said, we dissent from this restriction on public worship. We won't disobey it, we dissent from it. That would help, that would make a few people sit up. Maybe, lots of, maybe every Christian in Wales should write to the First Minister. Weekly. Daily. Uh, I mean it. Maybe every single Christian in Wales should be, not with words fed by us, every single Christian in Wales should write to the First Minister explaining, if they do, they're accepting, some Christians will take different views, uh, uh, explaining why they dissent from that decision. And they should write again and again and again. His post bag should be so overwhelming and enormous, he doesn't know what to do. Many Christians <laughs> supported lockdown back in March as being the responsible thing to do. Were we wrong to do that? And have you been surprised about the level to which Christians have gone along with the culture of fear and over-deference to silence? Has yeah. it surprised you? So, yes, it, ha it has. Um, I go just, let's just go back to March, despite that I was trying to pull out the order of events and explain what was happening. Um, I wasn't, although I wasn't attracted to lockdown, because I never am, because it kind of goes against my very being, nevertheless, I think probably most Christians at the time would have thought, we have no option. I think if that had been locked down with public worship, I might not have batted too, mu too much of an eyelid. And I think it's because we didn't know what the situation was. We didn't know about this virus. We didn't understand. We had just begun hearing from the scientific officers. I, I have no issue with the fact that decision was made. What I have issue with is the inability to move on from that decision and assess it in the light of new information. And the new information, it seems to me, is that we cannot destroy people's lives uh, 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 in order to find the magic cure. Uh, and the new information is, as uh, the information we had from Wales earlier, was there is vast differentials uh, across the country. Uh, uh, there is no good... Re I'm about to have two days away up near Wooler. Uh, up in northern Nor Northumberland, which is under the, which has got about three cases of coronavirus in a hundred square mile area, who is under the same restriction as the city centre and mm. Arthur's Hill, where all the students got it, is nonsense. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, and all of that I think has contributed, and the lack of a Christian voice has contributed to this culture of fear. And I know not everyone's going to agree with me, and I understand the complexities, uh, I've become much more irritated by the daily pounding out of statistics, uh, most of which I only half believe anyway, to be honest. I mean, you literally, you know, you go along thinking, well, those are the statistics, and suddenly Public Health England dump another 21,000 cases because they didn't know how to use Excel. And you think, my goodness, the Lord preserve us. You literally... And I've become very suspicious of the media response. I've become very suspicious of the uh, scientific community's uh, response. You see, you put 100 scientists in a room and you get exactly the same outcome as if you put 100 economists in a room. You get 100 different answers. And it's all very well saying the science says this. It all depends what you put into your model and it all depends what comes out. And I have to say, Patrick Valance, and I largely respect our senior scientific leaders, I listen to them too, and I'm not denigrating them, putting up that 
outrageous graph on the screen where it says, well, you know, if it all, if it doubles every seven days, this is what will happen. And, you know, then claiming, oh, well, I didn't, re it wasn't really a prediction. It was only a, a just in case what if. But millions of people watching it thought it was his prediction. Which is scandalous. Are there th some th things which science cannot answer? Yes, absolutely. What uh, are they? So, so science absolutely uh, can, uh, science can help you. All sorts of experts can help us. There's no question about that. Uh, all sorts of people in this room will know more about certain things than I know, and I will know more about certain other things than they will know. Uh, science can help us. Expertise uh, can help us. But neither science, nor law, nor eco economics, nor history, nor, th uh, I nearly said nor theology, but nor history can provide all of the answers about purpose, and meaning. In order to find answers about purpose and meaning, we need some form of world view. And if one's being really blunt about it, if it's a secular world view, you still need that to provide some form of answer. Of course, what we believe as Christians is the world view you need is the spiritual and godly world view, which understands his purpose in creation, which understands his purpose uh, in redemption. Uh, to make s you've got to make sense of the expertise rather than become dependent upon it. Thank you. Well, I think that concludes the questions. Can I thank Richard in very much indeed for the three lectures he's given to us? I think it'll be very edifying and illuminating and I hope very helpful and hope we'll use what he said in our day-to-day -day life. So thank you, Richard, for that. Thank you for coming to do these lectures. Thank you. We're very grateful indeed. Thank you. Can we just close what we're going to do in prayer? Heavenly Father, we realize that to be born again is an act of yourself. We pray you'll open up the hearts and the minds of our leaders, both in church and state, to your truths. We pray that they may come to know you, the living God, and your Son, Jesus Christ, and come to know him as Saviour and Lord. So we do pray that for our nation, for our churches, and for ourselves. And so can we conclude by saying together the Christian grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, evermore. Amen.